Look, I'll take a 1% split if I can make my million a year or whatever it is I want to make. I don't care what my split is. What I care is, are you a vehicle for me to hit my financial goals? There are not many people in, in the country, I probably know five of them because I work with them at Place, who are talking with as many real estate teams, looking at their P&Ls as, as me and, and my colleagues. What is up, everybody? It's Joe and Taylor coming to you live from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. It is our final Broker's Desk podcast of the year. Taylor, I came up with this concept maybe six months ago and just said, dude, let's, you know, we're in a virtual world. So many companies like ours are going virtual. You and I are still brick and mortar. But anyways, agents are used to kind of having that old wise sage in the corner of the office that they could always ask questions to. Let's create a, a podcast that provides real value to people's life that they could, you know, kind of learn from and and we told Adriana, like, hey, if we don't have a guest, we're not going to do it. Um, we're, you know, if we don't have a, a guest that really moves the needle, we're not going to do it. And we pretty much stuck to that. So overall, kind of what, looking back at 2023 Broker's Desk Podcast, what would you say are some of the highlights for you personally, as far as like, I, I would say mission accomplished. Like so far, I think we've had some good guests and people have really dug it. But what what stands out to you? Oh, man. Well, uh, yeah, this has been awesome. And it is crazy to think we're at the end of the year and it's uh, about to roll into 2024. I've been I've been thinking a lot. This year has been one of the probably since I got in the business in 2005, it's been one of the, I don't want to say hardest. I think one of the strangest years as far as what the market does. And I've realized more now than ever, there was an old a band. It's well ahead of your time, actually well ahead of all our times, but um a young man named Simon and a, a young friend of his named Garfunkel same a song called I am a rock I am an island and it's in real estate there truly is when you get into this there is a feeling that you you are on an island all by yourself and there's this leadership this loneliness and leadership that I've been thinking about and what this podcast has done for me and what it emphasizes in my life that while we are all little islands we're in a great a, a great community of islands and there's wonderful leaders out there. So when I think about the people that we've talked to so far that have been on our show, um, I mean, Jimmy was last week. It's hard not to think of Jimmy Mack. And when I go to the people that have influenced my life, we've known Jimmy since 2014 and worked with him on massive levels and been on stages together. And Jimmy has just been such an influence in my life in real estate. And I think in the entire real estate space, Jimmy has, he's got a perspective that he breaks things down to the very simplest forms. And then he's able to put them back together in a way that's easy for me to, to digest. He kind of, he kind of speaks my language. So um, loved everything Jimmy had to say. <clears throat> We've had some great friends on the show, people that, uh, you know, Veronica Fig and Eric Hatch and some people that just I I get real strength from them because we've been in the trenches together and we've built businesses alongside them over the years. And so um, Gubernick was amazing. Brian Gubernick's another one that I can just go back and listen to that. You know, he has his own podcast, No Days Off, and his mentality is the people who take no days off are the people who are going to end up on top eventually. And I just love that idea that all the shining, you know, smoke and mirrors and shiny objects and all the trickery that exists in this world and in this business is great. But really, no days off and just working hard and consistently are we're going to put us on top. So love that message that Brian shared. So I think I agree with you. I think there's something unique because if you look at Jimmy, you'd say, OK, he's an outsider that sees things from 30,000 feet, <clears throat> which is great. Right. And then there's also the necessity of, of being boots on the ground agent, seeing things from the one foot view. And I think that's where we try to keep ourselves grounded, but then we also try to be elevated. And in our industry, that is something very unique because you look at like um, uh, an Eric Hatch or a Brian Gubernick who spend their time largely trying to tackle 30,000 foot problems, right? Like how do we create a, a training or a system that will benefit you know, agents across all of North America. But then they also present tactical information that is able to be applied by somebody who's like in the trenches all day, every day. Jimmy Mackin last week gave a statistic that he and Tom Ferry came up with 
and remind me, I, I think it was like, if an agent is willing to commit to 30 contacts a day, 20 days a week, they will end up with 30 listings throughout the course of 2020. That's exactly it. Yep. And it's yep. just like the issue with that stat is just finding the human being. Like if you go biblical on this, when Sodom and Gomorrah was, was evaluated, God basically said, just find me one righteous person and I'll save the, like, and I won't destroy the whole city. And it literally couldn't be done. And so it's like, find me one agent who's willing to make 30 conversations a day, 20 days out of the month. And I'll show you someone who's going to absolutely dominate 2024. So Taylor, as somebody who's led teams, you ran an investment business, like, why is that so hard? Because when Jimmy says that, you're like, like, holy crap, the numbers, the math bears out. You and I did it this morning. We ran the math. We reverse engineered the whole thing. We're like, he is absolutely right. Based on a 20% close rate, a 50% show up rate, a 5% appointment set rate, <laughs> like all those numbers bear out. Why is it impossible, uh, nearly impossible to find that agent that's willing to do the 30, the 30 contacts? <laughs> I love being in in the room with somebody being in the world with somebody when they finally have you you started with biblical so let me just carry on with one of my favorite biblical moments but it's that coming to moment when the prodigal son is lying with the pigs and eating corn husks and completely covered in mud and he has this coming to mental awakening when he realizes there's a world that exists that is full of treasure and full of fine dining and people who love him and success and glory and all these good things and he picks himself up out of the mud and walks back to that world. And I think the reason, I, I, I mean, I watch I watch your social, your uh, cold plunges on social media and I'm like, I'm going to do cold plunges. Like, I'm going to do that. Gonna taste. That's going to that's gonna be so good for my heart and my circulation and everything else. And then when I get out of my car on the way home from work and it's like 48 degrees and I imagine how cold my hands are, I can't dip myself in the pool. <laughs> but I know that if I did it, it'd be good for me. So I, I honestly believe it's a mental awakening. It's that analogy being three feet from gold and people have tried and they've tried and they've tried and they try for three days and they don't want to do it for another day. And they're three feet from gold. And it's just getting that systems, that support. I think our, our special guest today is going to talk about some of the ways that we can bust through that right. three feet of rock to hit the gold mine. But what I've noticed is just, it's just going a little bit further and doing a little bit more than what's comfortable. And then we find the mother load. Yeah, I love it. Well, with that, let's bring on Via. Via, welcome. Whoops. There we go. Welcome, Via. Um, Thank you. So Taylor and I are just kind of going over our 2023. We started this podcast in like July. We've had some great guests. The principle we go off of is like, if we can't get a great guest, we're just not going to do the podcast. So there's mm -hmm. been weeks we've we've skipped because... Either the people we were going to do it with just just wouldn't bring the heat or what. But you are somebody that Taylor and I really, I think one of the things I love about you, Via, is you've, speaking of 30,000 foot view, you not only have a 30,000 foot view of the industry, but it's almost like market to market. Like you just have, so, you're yeah. so well connected. You know so many people. You talk to so many team leaders. So let's just kind of start with that. Like looking into 2024, Via, what do you, who is going to win? in 2024. You've mm. got all these team leaders across the country. You're, you're a, uh, I, I don't know what the official title is, like a growth leader with place. Like what, who is going to win 2024 and why? What a great question. And thank you for having me on. That is a, um, a cool thing. If you view me as worthy of having a podcast, I'll take that <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm ahead basically of you and Barack Obama. You, Barack Obama, <laughs> Oprah. Like, if we're gonna do it, we're just gonna yeah, we're just I'll gonna take bring in the heat. I'll take Oprah. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> Oprah. Um, but I so I'm the head of industry, and and I'm I'm also effectively a growth leader as well, which is a fancy way of saying I I recruit um, teams into place. And as you guys know, I tend to have a niche in the more iconic large teams. Um, mm -hmm you know, that, that a lot of us know, but that, you know, lately I, I, I do it all. I do it all. So I, I, there are not many people in, in the country. Um, I probably know five of them because I work with them at place who are talking with as many real estate teams, looking at their PLs as, as me and, and my colleagues. Um, we, mm. 
we're looking at right now, um, I've gone line item by line item on a PL every day of the last week, just to give you an example. Wow. These are teams in all areas of the country, all sizes, big, small, medium, all different team models. So who is going to win are the teams who lean into growth and recruiting and nailing their agent productivity systems. The teams who are going to lose are teams that are going to try to weather this by not recruiting because they're telling themselves, you know, all of the things and um, it's hard to get their own business, let alone bring other agents in. So the teams that are going to win, in my opinion, are going to lean into growth, um, recruit at a nice what? steady cadence and be ready for the market rise that I do think we're actually going to see this year. I think so. So let's talk about that really quick because we're in this danger zone where we probably will find ourselves in the next quarter in a place where no matter how bad you run your business, you're you're going to have some success because interest mm -hmm. rates are going to you know drop and we're going to see more inventory. So it's going to be easier to do a deal. But Taylor and I were talking about this very morning. Like the thing we can't do is let the success come without the like let undisciplined success come because when things get tough again, mm -hmm. it if you're not if your house is built upon the sand, it's just going to wash away, right? So why is recruiting so essential? Like why is agent count growth so essential to running a successful real estate team? Like why is that one of the lead indicators you look at? Well, that was the second biblical reference you've made this morning, House on Sand. I like <laughs> Third, it. actually. Yeah, uh, we're on three. Oh, yeah. third. Oh, I missed the first one. That's good. <laughs> well, okay. I, I would, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that and I'm going to, I'm going to re-ask the question if that's okay. And I'm going to, it's, there's, I think there's sort of four foundational things that teams need to look at right now. If you're looking at all of the systems that it takes you to run your team, um, I would say, yes, recruiting and retention systems. By the way, I didn't say events. I said systems. Very important mm. distinction. We can come back to yeah. that if you want. Recruiting and retention systems, agent productivity systems, your operations systems, and then your financial slash productivity systems. Those are really the four um, uh, foundational components of a team. So, you know, said another way, if you are not profitable in the way you're running it now, it, you know, don't don't scale a broken profit model right? It's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Um, right. And I mean, I can get really in the weeds on that if we want to get super nerdy, but um, I don't know how far you want to go with any of that. Like we could eat, that could be the whole thing. You know, it just depends what you want to. Well, because it's so tempting, right? For a team leader, Taylor and I met with a team leader yesterday and their idea was my agents aren't being overly productive. So what I want to do is just give them a higher split because I can make money on like a razor's edge. And we were both like, we're not the oldest dogs in the fight, but but we've we've gotten some scars. And we'll tell you, it doesn't, it's not profitable to just go like, hey, you're not really succeeding right now, but I'll give you more money so you don't leave. And then maybe I'll make a dollar. Like it's just it's yeah, hard well, though, because if people haven't done that, they don't know that that yeah. just doesn't work. Can we do some math together? Let's do math together. So the average PL that I see, expenses are anywhere from on average 35 to 55% expenses. Okay. But some teams are more dialed in, and I, I've seen a couple come in at 30%. That's like really solid. 28 to 30% right. is like super solid. Okay. So let's do a little math together. So if your cost of sale, which is your splits to agents, and also what you pay to your brokerage and what you pay to referral fees, really important to include that in there. Right. So if you're if you're working with a third party that charges 35%, that's going to turn to 40% or different, you know, different equations, you have to add that in. So let's right. pretend you have 70-30 with sphere deals and then maybe effectively a 35% referral fee on a percentage of your business that you're now sharing with your agent, which is effectively 65% that you're paying out on that deal, right? Because right. you're paying. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's pretend your blended average of all of it cost of sale is 65% to pick a number. And let's pretend that your expenses are 35%. What does that add up to? A hundred percent. <laughs> so that's the problem. But, but, so, but really quick, Via, so what people don't do though is they go, well, no, on a deal, a $10,000 commission comes in. And if I give 7,000 to the agent and I get 3,000, how am I losing money? 
well and we're like oh, ah, it's such an exhausting conversation money, though, it is an exhausting conversation but also how they're losing money and this is really probably the most important thing they can hear is that team owners and operators if you are doing you know your own production and you're paying a hundred percent of your production into your team and then you're paying yourself out a salary i have a i have a challenge for you take what you've done in production for your team this year pull 50 percent of that out right and see if your team is still profitable because you should be paying yourself at the same split that you're paying your agents. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're most likely supplementing your team. You're supplementing them, which is why you're not writing a check every month. And you're telling yourself that you're profitable. And the reality is you're probably losing money on your agents deals or you're breaking yeah. even on their deals. And then the, the slight amount over is your own personal production. It's just not a good model of scale that way. Right. Well, tell me, Tell me if you agree with these economics. Um, the way I explained it yesterday was, let's say you run a 70, 30, 50, 50 model mm -hmm. and you close 20 deals at an average of $10,000 commission. You know, a lot of assumptions. So $200,000 comes in, 10 of which in theory, you as a team leader keep 50% of, so that would be $50,000. And then, 10 deals close at a 70-30 split of which you keep 30% of, that would be $30,000. Now of the 200,000, you have a blended average where you're netting about 40%. If you have any costs at all, they all come off of you as the team leader. And so I was like, you know, if it costs you $20,000 a month to run your team, you've got a CRM, you've got some lead generation, you've got bagels, you've got, if you run an auto, you've got toilet paper and lights, and yeah. office staff and whatever. So let's say it costs you $30,000 to run your team. And you're like, well, yeah, it only cost me 30, but I brought in, you know, 80. It's like, well, no, it, it doesn't work that way because the 30 doesn't come off of the 200. Yeah. The 30 comes off of the 80. And so now in effect, you're, what you think is you making 50% sometimes and 70% sometimes, so, or 30% sometimes. So you blend it and go like, I'm going to make 45%. It's like, no, no, no. You're actually going to make, you know, on average, let's, let's call it, you know, 40% and you have 30% cost. You're now going to make 10% and hope to your point, you have no referral fees. Mm -hmm. You have no buyer concessions. You have no seller concessions. Yeah. And so it's like, but it's so hard for people to see that because they go, well, no, no, no. 200,000 comes in and I get 80. We're like, no, no, no. 200,000 comes in and you get like, 10. It's, and, yeah, it's really important that that operators right now are looking at what the, your what your own personal production is. OK, so look at what what you would make um, either a on your own or B if you if you shared it 50 50. So that that's number one. Number two, I love your example. And also at 20, I don't know how much scale you have to do, but here's when it gets challenging. When you're running two, three hundred units, whatever that is, there's a lot of um, admin and infrastructure you have to pay for. And so the problem is, is you're not getting enough to make a profit on covering all of that. The other challenge I would say is probably not happening is you are not offering a pretty, it's probably not a very exciting value stack to your team above and beyond simply the fact that they are getting leads in that split. And by the way, if they are getting your leads, uh, you can get a ton of agents who will pay really healthy splits to you if, you're, if that's what your value is. Like you don't have to like play around with your splits like that, but you're just not making enough profit to be able to offer a lot of incentive to stay above and beyond what your split is. And so it's a cycle and it keeps holding you in the messy middle and you're never gonna really get to a point where you're growing and scaling a massive, big, healthy business. And you just can't. None of the large, big, huge teams, they're all of their blended average cost to sale, I guarantee you is at least in the 50s. Some of it might be closer to 60, um, but the really good ones are at 45 to 50. And the reason 45 is because they're building in overages to pay like sales managers and different people on the team, some of their admin to pay a certain percentage of either revenue or sales. Uh, and so the, you just won't make it past probably that that middle zone that you're in. And then it gets to the question is, what do they do? Do they disturb the herd? Do they blow it all up? Do they fire everybody and start over? No, not necessarily. That's not necessarily what, what we recommend. 
you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you can do it. One one way to do it um, is you can start you can start assigning lead source at different splits is like a softer way to kind of phase out of that. Yeah. So you can say, okay, we're not going to change it. Heads up, everybody! All new agents we hire, we're going to hire to X Y Z split over here. So that's number one. Number two, what we're going to do is these leads leads X Y and Z. Um, what we're going to do is charge you this split. Let us know if you want to opt in or out. You don't have to opt in. And you just start, you know, it's a little more time consuming and complicated, but it's a way to build up a really good, um, healthier team simultaneously while not having all of your other agents exit. So let me ask you this, Via, because this is kind of, it gets into, I love the math and I love the numbers, but it gets into a little bit of the culture of our industry. When I got into real estate in 05, I think it was, 2006, the next year I was with Remax and I got my, my name appeared in like the Remax newspaper because I had become a member of, I think it was called the president's club or something. And what that meant is I had done a hundred thousand dollars in gross I think it was called the Sultan's, the Sultan's circle or something like that. You were joined like the <laughs> Sultan's wow. Sultan circle. The Sultan's like 50, 200. <laughs> and I didn't get the Sultan's. I got like the small print. It wasn't bold. It wasn't underlined. It's just my name in the mix of a thousand other people because I did that. The, the industry we're in is all about gross commission, units closed. It's all about total volume. But the number that never shows up on any podiums or any awards or anywhere <laughs> else is profitability. And you guys, and I know Ben stood on stage at Real with Tamir and was asked point blank, what do agents need to be better at? And in a very disrupting, <laughs> like what he said was, we need to be concerned with profitability and quit caring about gross commissions. And so what are you guys doing? I mean, that's a very, uh, it's, it's a disrupting thing to say in a world and a culture that's built around total units closed and awards and trophies for gross for volume and commissions, how are you guys teaching that principle and and how uh, ready are big teams and agents and top producers and anybody ready to adopt that principle of profitability versus total units or gross commission? Well, that's the question. That's Taylor. That's really the question because what we're doing, I and mean, we've already had a sample of it, attacking cost of sale. Cost of sale is your number one charge, expense, end of story. So referral fees and splits that you pay out to your agents. And yeah, we, we also consider cost of sale you pay to your brokerages, but that's usually not, certainly with, with real, if that's not an issue, right? So, um, so the number one thing that you have to tackle that's extraordinarily unpopular and that Costs, costs people coming to place. Like I could close way more people if I if I didn't, you know, go there. But it's it, you can't have a healthy team without having a healthy cost of sale because we just did the math, right? So if you could get your cost of sale at forty percent, you can get your expenses at twenty five to thirty percent. You've got a massive margin, and we have some. Our average teams, um, and you guys probably know this, but our listeners don't know this. Our average team at place is around 20% expenses. Now, I will grant you that's extraordinarily low, and that's because of what we offer. Like, I don't know that that's a, sort of realistic necessarily, but I do think 30% is realistic. And I've seen plenty of teams that are doing a good job with 30%. So if you keep your cost of sale at 50% and you have 30% expenses, you know, that's a 20% margin. It's, I'd like to see higher and we have, you know, we call it the 30 club. We have a, a group of teams that are over 30%, but I'll take 20 as a starting point that you can build off of, especially because if you can lean into recruiting and really keep your productivity up, you could probably keep that expense pretty flat, at least not, not that much, you know, and then you could grow and hopefully that percentage of a whole can go down to 25% maybe. So um, how we do that is, you know, is, um, I mean, happy to talk about it, but how you do that is it's, it's, you know, there's, it's a lot of answers to that. It's not just one thing. Well, yeah. Let me ask you this. How do, you know, we've got maybe, maybe five or 10 minutes left. How, what, what advice do you give to team leaders who have done a historically bad job at like sharing with their team, the team leader's profitability, right? So it's like, at some point you have to be able to say to your team, like, hey guys, listen, and, and I try, like, we'll have a conversation where I'm like, hey, if, if we do a deal that's a 50-50 split, keep in mind your 50% 
is pretty close to 50% in CI, like net commission. Mm -hmm. Our 50% as a team may be somewhere around a 10% in CI. Like if there's $10,000 mm -hmm. that comes in, you're going to get a check for pretty close to five. The team is going to make about $800. Mm -hmm. And like, they're like, how is that possible? Like Taylor just bought an Audi, right? And so it's like, there's this perception from the team member like I work so hard and I close that deal and Taylor took his family to the Maldives. And it's like, how do team leaders do a better job at sharing with their mm. team members? Like, it's not what you think it is. When $10,000 comes in and you get five, it's not like Taylor walks with $2,500 and Joe walks with $2,500. We probably buy toilet paper and like pay for the lights at the office. It's mm. not like we take that money and feed our family with it. Like how... What's your recommendation for that conversation? I love that question. I love that, you know, that 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 whole sentiment. I love this whole conversation. I've talked to Ben Kinney about it before. And I think first of all, we we have to hire people who are not going to resent seeing their partner's success. And so, you know, we start there. Number two, mm -hmm. At when we're hiring and when we're when we're you know in coaching conversations, I really focus on what we call OTE or on target earnings. I I always tell you know my agents and and I've shared this with Ben before. Look, I'll take a one percent split if I can make my million a year or whatever it is I want to make. I don't care what my split is. What I care is, am I going? Am I going? Are you a vehicle for me to hit my financial goals? And my and my other person, right. right? And so mm -hmm. I try to impart that to my agents that I hire and then in retention, you know, and and winning together, like I can safely say I love th that Ben Kinney makes um, is wealthy. I, it makes me happy. I'm thrilled to participate in that. It makes he's a friend. He's a, a mentor. You know, uh, I hope he buys another Porsche soon. Right. And mm -hmm. I know <laughs> that he relishes in me. Um, becoming wealthy as well. That's, that's, that's who, that's a cultural uh, thing that I do think starts at recruiting by focusing on the win and focusing on and being, being a, um, transparent in the financials. So, but you asked another question and that question was, how do we handle sharing the financials? And, you know, one of the ways we can do that is just share them. You know, I always tell, tell the agents, you know, that, I think that it's easy to assume that that $5,000 of your $10,000 commission example is going to me or, or my brother, Paul, who's my partner. It's going to the holding company and that holding company, you know, um, on an annual basis, we, we pull a profit, but there are some months where we don't January often is one of those months, like in, in aggregate, we run a profit, but we're shouldering, um, you know, all of this for them. But I, I also think, and It'd be, I'd be remiss to leave this out. I also think me, I'm going to just say for me, but I, I think most of us do a poor job in really sharing the value that the team is bringing for that split. I think that that's where a lot of us struggle. And then our natural reaction is to yeah. just increase the split. And so mm -hmm. w when our agents start selling more to their database and to their sphere and through other means that aren't necessarily team generated leads, the typical team starts losing the agent. So what they say in their head is, well, I just need to give more team leads because if I give more team leads, I'll stay. And I get it. I understand that. Like, trust me, I, I totally get it. But the challenge I would give you is, could you give so much value so that you could look them in the eye and say, Joe, Taylor, you sold 12 to your sphere last year before you were on the team with everything we have here that, and we're going to go spend time going through that in, in our recruiting process, I believe we can get you to 24 in your sphere alone, just with the resources we have here on the team. So in other words, can you show them a massive amount of value, even on their self-gen side? That's the key. I think that's really key. Yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. where a lot of teams well, need to spend more time and energy. No, yeah. I love that. And I, I think it's a confidence thing, right? Like, I think it's, I know, historically speaking, Taylor and I, specifically me, because, uh, you know, I'm so good at lead generation that I've leaned on it so heavily that it, it comes back to bite you, right? Like if, you're, if your entire marriage is based on adventure sports and you get old and you can't climb mountains anymore, <laughs> like, or you get desensitized to the adrenaline rush of jumping off of a cliff, you're like, all right, well, can we, can we watch movies together? Can we read books? Like, can we find value in a relationship beyond just the one thing? You're right. 
And right. historically speaking, it's been so easy to build a team by saying we're going to give you leads that we now, with our relationship with Place, are going through that process of saying like, all right, cool. We have to be able to show people the value of being in our world beyond just take our leads and close them. So let me ask you this. We've got a few minutes left. Like, What gives you hope heading into 2024? Be like, what? What are you going like? All right, cool. We've been through it because 2023 was crazy. Like, it was the weirdest market we've been in. When Taylor and I hit the recession in 06, it sucked, but there was clear path to success. It was like, get REO accounts, understand short sales, units are moving, go crush it. 2023 wasn't necessarily like that. There wasn't that clear path to do this one thing and you will find success. 2024 though, maybe. So what are you optimistic about? What are you hopeful about heading into 2024? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great a great question. From a, a macroeconomic standpoint, um, Goldman Sachs and many others um, think we are going to get down into the fives for interest rates. And I'm very optimistic that we have a pent up demand of buyer pool that, that's going to emerge. Um, from a being in the weeds with hundreds of real estate teams standpoint, I'm optimistic that we learn the lessons and the downturn that you mentioned in 2006 and seven teams, teams without prompting have already slashed expenses. They, they are committed. They understand that growth is growth is necessary. I don't see a lot of pushback on a lot of these concepts that I felt a little bit more when things were frothy. So the combination of the market probably returning at least for at least for a period of time and then teams leaning in, I, I, what I do think is we're going to start seeing more of a, con- I already felt it, more of a consolidation. And what I mean by that is I am working with four teams right now to talk about incorporating other teams into their team. So I do think that some of the small, weaker teams are probably going to end up folding into the bigger team. The big ones will get bigger and better. And some of the small ones, you know, might might dissipate a little bit. But I also see emerging new teams on the rise on their way up who are setting themselves up you know, in this foundation, in this market really well. So I'm I, I, I'm much more optimistic about next year than I was this year. I think next year is going to be a better year than this year. Mm. Love it. How about you, Taylor? What What's got you excited? What's got you hopeful for 2024? Besides Naya coming I mean, home, Taylor's, Taylor's daughter has been down in Chile for... A year. She's coming oh, home yeah. uh, in a couple of months. So that's got to get you. May 3rd, she comes home and life. Okay. Yeah. I can have the worst real estate year of my life and I'd still be happy. But I think the, uh, I think the low hanging fruit for 2024, all of us, the easy thing to say is rates will go down, more buyers will emerge and we'll be back to 2021. I think, you know, with Via and, and Via, you've reiterated this over and over again. The thing that I'm really excited about is yes, that, I think that will happen. I think rates will come down and I think the pent up buyer stuff will happen. So excited about that. But what I'm really excited about is all of the work, all of the, like Joe and I literally sit in the office three hours a day, brainstorming and charting and graphing and thinking and positioning and operations and systems and getting better. I'm so excited and hopeful that all of that work that we've done in a down market, when it gets into a healthy market, it'll, it'll just be like the, you know, the greatest kind of luck and opportunity coming together when opportunity and preparedness comes together and it just creates this wonderful thing. So I'm excited that operators and people who have put in the work can succeed on a level that they've never succeeded before because they were willing to to bleed a little bit during this rough, tricky market we've been going through. Yeah, I love that. And I, and I think to end it all for 2024, um, or 2023, heading into 2024, one of my favorite speakers, a guy by the name of Jeffrey R. Holland said, uh, the beauty of the whole game is we already know who's going to win. We just have to decide what jersey we're going to put on. And obviously that was in a spiritual reference, but in a, in a financial reference, I would think you're heading into 2024, you just have to decide, like, imagine, imagine going to a bowling alley and them saying like, you will have the best time of your life, the best, the best bowling experience of your life. If you roll the ball this many times. And like if they just broke it down and said, hey, Joe, if you throw the ball down the alley 27 times, you're going to roll the perfect game. The good news for agents are if they're willing to do the minute, if they're willing to say, I'm going to make 
20 calls a day, 20 days a month, I'm thoroughly convinced no matter how bad they are at what they say, no matter how bad they are at actually closing deals, they will come pretty dang close to 20 deals in 2024 if they make mm -hmm. their 20 calls a day. The problem is not getting the 20 deals. The problem is having the discipline to make your calls every single day. And that, I think, Via, I think that's what excites me the most is I am on the prowl. I'm on the hunt to find the person who's willing to commit to 15 calls a day, 20 calls a day, 25 calls a day. Because if we find that person, it's not a matter of deciding who's going to win and lose. All they have to do is put on that uniform. And if they put on that uniform and say, I am that agent who makes those 15 calls, they will get that reward. 100%. And having, pe having people like you in our world, Ben and Chris and Brian, like we're so grateful for our partnership with Place, which launched three or four months ago. It will come in full power in 2024 when people you know, are able to see what we, the pivots we make as the Joe Taylor Group with the guidance of people like yourself and Ben and Chris. We're, we're super excited. So we're grateful for you and grateful for your partnership. Thank you. Yeah, so are we. And, you know, like like you said, if we run the plays every day, the score will take care of itself, right? So we focus exactly. on the process, not the outcome, because the outcome is going to come with the process. Mm -hmm. Well, Via, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. You happy Kwanzaa. Like, whatever it is we're celebrating this time of year. Christmas. Um, we're grateful for you. And Christmas. There Ian, we go. Looks Merry like Christmas. An angel. If you moved your head to the right, like a few inches, Via, you, other way, yeah, you'd have right there. Like, yeah, you look like an angel. <laughs> Christmas angel. <laughs> I can't. Okay, guys. Yeah. Merry, anyway. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Thank Bia. you for having me on. Bye. Thanks, Via. You guys.